very much, sir. <laughs> Tell the players what our program is. Thank you. Well, read it. Thank you, sir. I'll pass mine to someone else if need be. All right, so yeah. So welcome to the Brattleboro Democracy Forum. I'm Woody, host, and with Nick and Tim. And uh, obviously I'm here because I dream of democracy. Not the democracy we currently have, we currently have, but potential in democracy for representing all people equally instead of just a privileged few. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. We're raising the, the Civil Rights for All banner on Main Street on Labor Day, and we're raising money for that, and there's a donation can over there. Uh, this time it's going to cost us $300 because I think we can get it up on its own without paying $600, which we normally have to pay, which is for two banners. We have to buy the space. But I think we can get away with just buying space for one, and they'll let us get by there. Um, also, we're thinking, uh, we're talking to the Brooks Memorial Library about having the Brattleboro Democracy Forum up there as well in the evenings. So that's very exciting for me. We, I think we can reach more people in a bigger audience. So, Nick will be presenting today. We've already heard about the subject, I think. Continuation of last time. Oh, great. Well, thanks very much, Nick. Thank you, Bill. Hey, Bill, how are you? Good. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, part two of what I started a week a month ago. Um, about how the Cold War really got going, and I call it the bastard birth. Um, and I hope that becomes clear why I call it that by the end of what I'm about to say. Uh, so I gave some uh, handouts there. I'll periodically through this talk suggest that we look at these quotes which follow from, from my uh, remarks here. Uh, so to begin, you know, World War II started in uh, September 1st of 1939, and here in the United States we like to forget that, because for the people of the United States, World War II started on December 7th, 1941, which is two years and three months later. Uh, and the reason it was two years later before the United States got going is because the United States had its head in the sand so utterly. Uh, I would call it that now, through what's called isolationist politics, this concept that the, you know, the oceans are big enough that they can't get us, and World War I was such a mess, forget about it, I don't want to do it again, and who gives a crap about Jews, literally. Um, but, you know, you know, Hitler invades Poland, and four days beforehand, a British spy had organized the theft of this machine that's called the Enigma that I referred to earlier. And it's the code breaker of the Nazis. And it goes back into the hands of the British, and there's a house called Bletchley Park um, outside of London in which all the world's code breakers, including a couple of US MIT types, go there and they try to break the code. And it takes them until like May of June, I mean, May of uh, 1940, before they start to figure it out, um, which is very convenient because that's exactly when uh, already Nazis have invaded Western Europe and France, and the British army is about to be completely wiped out in what turns into this Battle of Dunkirk. And because Bletchley had partially decoded German movements of troops, Churchill was able to create enough political ploys to create just enough time and organize, anybody who saw the movie, all those uh, private you know, fishing boats to go across the channel and pick up the, the, the majority of the 300,000 troops that were still there and get them back to England. Otherwise, you know, who the heck would have known? 
what would what would have transpired. So that was wonderful, the first the first sort of success of Enigma. Um, and immediately thereafter, you know, Hitler starts bombing London, and it's at that point that you know the code breakers start to realize, oh no, you know, we understand that you know, London's going to get bombed. And um, the only yeah, I think we should wait until that fan turns off. <laughs> How long? No. It's not long. It's not long. <laughs> by the train. <laughs> so. Um, the, 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 code, the codes that are broken at Bletchley are given to two people. They're given to Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. And the third person, William Stevenson, who is the agent who stole the Enigma machine. And so Churchill and, and, and Roosevelt have to decide what to do with this information. And when they learn that London is going to get bombed in such and such a place, they have to decide whether to prepare for it or not, and they choose not to because then they might tip off to the, to the Germans that they've got this, this machine. And <clears throat> this continues, but you know, Roosevelt's sitting in the White House learning this information, watching Hitler do his dirties, and uh, you know, pretending nothing's going on. So much so that even in October of 1940, Roosevelt's you know, campaigning for the president, and he's saying, in front of big crowds, American boys will never go to Europe. He's campaigning on that promise while he's secretly funding and giving weapons and all sorts of assistance to the British to fight the war. And he set up in Rockefeller Center this British MI6 you know, you know, spy named Bill Stevenson has a, a, an office in Rockefeller Center called British Security Coordination out of which the whole, almost the whole of the secret wars of World War II are organized with Bill Stevenson at the head. It's interesting, in 1940, around April, just when this office is being set up, Roosevelt thinks, hey, I, gotta, I should have a counterpart in London. And Bill Stevenson, and he put their heads together, and they come up with this fellow named Bill Donovan whose nickname is Wild Bill Dunn. And he's a lawyer on Wall Street who worked for the Justice Department just a couple years before as an antitrust lawyer for whom Roosevelt had said at a Columbia Law School uh, you know, celebration, alumni gathering, that if Bill Donovan was a Democrat, he'd be in my place, which is how well FDR esteemed Bill Donovan. So secretly, Roosevelt pulled Donovan in and sent him to London as his emissary without telling the ambassador who was Joe Kennedy, John Kennedy's father. Joe Kennedy was pro-Nazi. So that on the 9th of September, for instance, eight days after Hitler had invaded Poland, Joe Kennedy decided to send all his children back to the United States. And so he had a big dinner in, in wherever, the embassy house. And he picked up his glass and he said to the Germans, they will destroy the British in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Rand Roosevelt didn't think it was such a good idea to tell Kennedy about Donovan. But, so, but Donovan goes there and as things develop, I, I, I mention him, because he becomes the head of what later become became known as the Office of, Secure, of Secret Services, the OSS, which was the American predecessor to the CIA, the, C, you know, the CIA of World War II, the American CIA. And the concept was, of course, that Stevenson and Donovan, who were great friends, had fought together in World War I, and so was, you know, they were all good friends, that they would all coordinate this all together. It didn't quite work out that way. In November of 1940, Hitler decided to start bombing civilian targets. And he bombed this town called Coventry. And he absolutely wiped it off the map, killed about 40,000 people. And he started using the term to Coventry eyes. I'm going to Coventry eyes England. And by that time, Roosevelt was getting pretty much the full messages and could hear that. And Roosevelt wrote in his own diary, you know, this war is causing me to play God because they couldn't allow 
the people of Coventry to know they were about to get killed. But they did get killed. And Roosevelt knew that and didn't do anything. Um, and that's just the beginning of an extraordinary amount, an array of times, of course, from that point forward, that both Roosevelt and Churchill lived with the knowledge of slaughter coming to the, this way and that, and it's keeping their mouth shut for their own strategic uh, initiatives. So then finally World Har uh, Pearl Harbor happens. Uh, the United States um, you know, launches the war, um, and uh, FDR, as we when I went through the, the, the main gist of last, uh, last month's talk was about his vision for the post-World War and this four nation declaration with the, uh, with the four nations, China, Russia, England, and the United States joining together in uh, what was called the four nation declaration on the 30th of October, 1943, and declaring that they would work together to maintain a peaceful globe through the United Nations, which was already on the, you know, in the books as a blueprint. And this, these four nations would assemble an enforcement agency with a mission to go around the world after World War II was over and disarm the whole world and force every territory on Earth to implement basic civil rights and self-determination, the principles of civil rights and self-determination. Russia agreed, China agreed, Britain agreed, obviously the United States. And on that basis, Roosevelt imagined a, po a peaceful post-world post -war, war world. And <clears throat> we know that didn't happen. And now when you read the history of World War II and when you read the history of FDR and his foreign policy, if you read the standard, what's called historiography, uh, FDR is painted as a kind of dreamer, as a, a false wish uh, creator, and that all of this post-war vision was so much a bunch of fantasy. Uh, and mostly because Roosevelt basically disdained the State Department, and he, he worked around the State Department. He worked directly with Stalin. He communicated directly with Stalin. He didn't care what the State Department advised him. He didn't care what the State Department complained about. He just worked with Stalin. And so it angered a good portion of the State Department. And Roosevelt was un, you know, unconcerned about that. Uh, he kept doing it. And, and of course he did die. But the first quote, oh no, I guess that's not, I guess we're not gonna get that. I took that out. Okay. So if you read uh, one historian named John Lewis Gaddis, he's the only historian of the Cold War, and I took that quote out unfortunately, who gives FDR credit for understanding that if you're gonna work, look at Russia, um, look to how since 1945, anything that's gotten done positively between U.S. and Soviet relations or U.S. and Russian relations tends to happen because of personal relationships between presidents. So Reagan, Gorbachev, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy and Khrushchev were, were closely involved in trying to stop nuclear armaments. Prior to that, Eisenhower had convinced Stalin that, he, that they were equals. Um, and so Gaddis sees Roosevelt's foreign policy strategy as actually maybe the best one, given the circumstances. In exactly that moment that uh, the Four Nation Declaration uh, was signed, Roosevelt assigned his new ambassador to Russia, Avril Harriman. Avril Harriman and Franklin Roosevelt were good friends. They came from the same kind of family. They were both in the 0.1% of American elites. Averill's father was the founder, creator of the Union Pacific Railroad. Because of his interest in the West, Averill had seen and visited Tsar Nicholas when he was eight years old, had learned Russian when he was 14 years old, had been to Russia uh, several times before the Bolshevik Revolution, 
and in his mid-20s went to Russia and negotiated with Trotsky in 1919 for an iron ore uh, contract. And so Harriman knew Russia, loved Russia, and he came from the same place as, as Roosevelt, and he also had the same vision about the Four Nation Declaration. And so Harriman was to take over, or did take over in Moscow, exactly during the signing of the Four Nation Declaration. Just before that transition, Harriman was in DC assembling his diplomatic team. And he didn't have a Russian expert, and so he called upon a good friend of his named Chip Boland, who was the undersecretary in charge of Soviet affairs in the State Department. And Boland said, there's this fellow out here who, you know, he happens to be in DC right now, um, who I think, you know, will, will, will do this job well. His name's George Kennan. And George Kennan and Chip Boland had um, entered the State Department together to study in the 1920s under a guy named Robert Kelly, who was creating a State Department program to understand the new Soviet Union. From 1917 to 1933, the United States did not recognize Russia because we had tried to stop the Bolshevik Revolution by supporting the white Russians. Wilson failed at that, 10,000 American soldiers were lost, and the Russian government was quite angry at that effort, and the United States pretended that it was angry too, and so there was no diplomatic relationship, but the State Department thought in the 1920s maybe it should get ready to have a diplomatic relationship, so it started a program to study and train for that, and George Kennan and Chip Boland were two of the first students of eight that worked under this guy Kelly. This is funny how I kind of skipped that so much. There we go, that's great. Um, I'm skipping right ahead so that I can get this done in more than enough time. Um, Kennan meets Harriman for lunch in DC. And Harriman thinks, hey, this guy's smart. He knows his stuff. He knows Russia. He'll do. So they sign up. And three days later, they go to Moscow. And the thing about Kennan, that Harriman at that point didn't know, is that since his time in 1928, studying to be a Russian diplomat, he had this habit of writing long, prosaic articles about Russia that were highly critical of the Soviets. From start to finish, he was anti-Bolshevik. And he would write these articles and try to get them in the face of, of important people and who dismissed him, including his teachers. So finally, I get to refer to one of these quotes that I've assembled, um, which is on the second page, quote number five. And this is talking about George Kennan. Roy Henderson was one of his mentors in that program in the State Department, who described Kennan as, <coughs> quote, he showed signs of intellectual arrogance. His opinions were highly subjective, and when asked to back them with facts, he would argue that they were intuitively obvious. In 1931, way before this meeting with Harriman, way before World War II, way before a whole lot of stuff, George Cannon wrote a small essay about the possibility of the United States and the Soviet Union having relationships at some distant future, which is what he was studying to learn how to do. So quote six is a quote from an essay written in 1931. The present system of Soviet Russia is unalterably opposed to our traditional system that there can be no possible middle ground or compromise, their D is a, a, a typo, compromise between the two. 
The two systems cannot even exist together in the same world unless an economic cordon is put around one or the other of them and that within 20 or 30 years, either Russia will be capitalist or we shall be communists. How's that for a vision of the future? So this is the fellow that Harriman takes with him to Moscow in 1943 at the end of November. And immediately upon arriving, Kennan is typing out these exact same missives. And almost weekly, you know, something 10 pages long lands on Harriman's desk for Harriman to read and then send on to the State Department. Harriman reads it, but does not send it to the State Department. Because this is ridiculous. Um, how excessive, how taunting, Etc. how intellectually arrogant Kennan is. However, Harriman appreciates that in Kennan he has the perfect foil, the perfect devil's advocate. And he kind of enjoys, he needs to have that voice to temper his own Rooseveltian voice, which sees the possibilities of kind of rosy future with Stalin. And so he keeps Kennan around. And years later, um, so you like to find that in my own notes, years later, Harriman uh, writes in his own, uh, in his own, there we go, uh, autobiography, um, that Kennan's discourses were so much, quote, batting at flies, unquote. But he had good instincts, and he was a man who understood Russia, but did not understand the United States. Okay, so now let's pull back for a second. It's uh, the end, the World War II is, is, is happening. It's coming to an end. We see the light. The United States is heavily involved. The Nazis are in retreat. They're already leaving Germany. I mean, they've already left Russia. They're being pushed west. The Japanese are being pushed um, west as well. Uh, and, and FDR is focused on this post-war world. Harriman is there to help him do that. Meanwhile, the secret armies have been underway. A couple things have been happening, primarily the Manhattan Project. It's in 1942, once the United States was engaged in World War II, that Roosevelt formally transferred the whole management of the Manhattan Project from himself and Jim, Bill Stevenson to General Leslie Groves, who built the Pentagon in the 1930s. And Leslie Groves built Los Alamos and the laboratories. And Leslie Groves co contracted the, the scientists, Feynman, Oppenheimer, Teller, and the Germans, Klaus Fuchs, for instance, uh, who came together in Los Alamos and built the atomic bomb. And once that got going, Roosevelt let it go in the sense that he didn't occupy himself daily with the operation of the Manhattan Project. Groves cordoned off Los Alamos and made it very, very difficult for any of the scientists to leave or anybody to come in. No communications were permitted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Through 1939 to 1942, Bill Stevenson, with FDR and Churchill's uh, approval, was working with the Russian Soviet agents to get rid of every effort towards nuclear bomb that Germany was, under, was, was at, you know, taking. So the Russians and the US and Britain worked collect co coordinatedly from 39 to 42 to destroy Germany's pursuit of a nuclear bomb. And they are the reason that the United States was building it in the first place. Einstein told Roosevelt in 39, the Germans are, you know, three quarters of the way to a nuclear bomb. Niels Bohr is the man. You've got to watch out. So that's why there is a Manhattan Project. And the Russians know it. They're in on it. But in 42, Groves cordons off Los Alamos, and Roosevelt lets him have it, and the communication between the Russians 
and their allies, the US and the British, around all things nuclear shuts down. And it angers the Russians, needless to say. Stalin is a paranoid man. And he sees the English and the, and the United States starting to collaborate against him, which is not good for relations. But another thing is happening, which is that Bill Donovan is running the OSS. And Bill Donovan has assembled this wild cast of characters uh, to, to you know, be spies. Most of them come from his old Yale friends, and Harvard, and Princeton, and Wall Street. Um, and <clears throat> there, amidst MI5, which is the domestic intelligence, who are coordinating Bill Donovan's operations, some communication with Bill Stevenson, is this Oxford-educated, tall, dapper, extremely uh, uh, articulate man who's risen to the top tier of the spy agency named Kim Philby. Kim Philby was a spy, quote number seven, recruited into the Russian Secret Service in 1935. Kim Philby had become the key man in Section 5 of the British Secret Intelligence Service. Philby was perfectly placed to do mischief to the Anglo-American alliance. In the race to build an atomic bomb, the partnership was compulsive. The Soviet Union was treated as an honest ally, and the full extent of subversive activities by Russian agents against the Western alliance was only vaguely understood. Anglo-American cooperation in this enterprise was harassed by communist mischief making and later betrayed by Soviet spies. Now the next paragraph talks about how, just to follow up on Philby, between 47 and 62, Philby was third in command of the CIA, had an office next to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Every action the CIA took, especially covert actions, went through Philby's hands. From 47 to 62, every damn thing the CIA did went to Moscow before it went to the, the, the actual spies in the CIA. Obviously, nobody knew that until 62 when Philby fled to Moscow. But in 1943 and 44, things were already getting discomforting between the OSS and the, and the secret, the BSC, which is Stevenson, because Philby was sabotaging communiques, he was sabotaging orders, he was spewing rumors. These guys, the English, are doing bad things to the, to the Americans, the Americans are doing things to the British. And Roosevelt and Churchill saw that things weren't going well, but they didn't have time. You know, as it says, in the rush to build the atomic bomb, you know, the partnership was compulsive. They had to keep it going. And so there was something wrong, but there was no time to deal with it. Roosevelt was feeling, you know, was thinking about this, right? And 43 turns into 44. The big event of 44 is D-Day, which is truly the, the, the victory, the moment of, of apex uh, climactic coordination between covert and overt operations. OSS, the BSC, and the US Army under Eisenhower managed D-Day trick the Germans into thinking they're going, you know, to Calais, but they're going over to Dunkirk, or not to Dunkirk, over to Normandy, et cetera, et cetera, and it goes well. After D-Day, it was just a matter of time before the war was over. And, you know, and Roosevelt's thinking, okay, it's coming. Late 1944, Eisenhower's uh, chief of staff, a guy named General Walter Bedell Smith, because Eisenhower orders him to, Smith contacts Donovan in London and says, tell me what's going to happen to the OSS after World War II. What's, what do you see the OSS becoming? So <laughs> Donovan writes a big report imagining what actually turns into the CIA. But he sends it to Roosevelt. And Roosevelt 
receives his report, and here's a, a quote from Donovan's report. He imagines what he called a Central Intelligence Service, as in the British Secret Service, Central Intelligence Service to learn the capabilities and intentions and activities of foreign nations while running subversive, subversive operations against America's enemies. Roosevelt took that report from Donovan, who was his friend, and immediately uh, ordered an investigation into the OSS and Donovan on the knowledge that there had been many failures of the OSS. And, um, you know, uh, Roosevelt was setting Donovan up for failure. So he orders an investigation. And I, I, I have to read this. This is what one historian, uh, this is how one historian describes Donovan's OSS. A scattershot collection of Wall Street brokers, Ivy League eggheads, soldiers of fortune, ad men, newsmen, stunt men, second story men, and con men. Their exploits were exaggerated, their failures hidden. Roosevelt gets that report in February 1945. What does he do with it? He leaks it to newspapers across the nation. And March 2nd, March 3rd, 1945, Donovan plans American Gestapo. March 6th, 1945, the chief of the Joint Chiefs of Staff officially announces all plans for a post-war spy agency are off the table. Roosevelt has ended, in his mind, a spy service after World War II. And then, now it's March. 1945. Now he's gotten one thing done in preparation for this new war, war, this new world that he's hoping for. Now he pulls in his only left, his only ally left in the spy world, Bill Stevenson. And he says, you know, Bill, the world will not be able to live well with atomic energy. And if the, if there's atomic energy, there's secret warfare because you can't have atomic energy without keeping it all so secret. The new tone, you know, where do you get the plutonium? How do you get the uranium? All of that. Not to mention the bombs, where are you going to keep them? You, to have nuclear energy, you have to have massive spy networks. So let's get rid of the whole shebang. Stevenson says, great idea. How are you going to do that? Well, you saw I'm going to tell the world about the Manhattan Project. Stevenson says, you're the boss. And during March, Roosevelt writes a speech that he plans to deliver on Thomas Jefferson's birthday, which happens to be the 13th of April, 1945. And somewhere between late March and early, you know, the first week of April, he sends a draft of that to Bill Stevenson. And we need that speech. I don't have a copy. But Bill Stevenson put one line into his biography. See where I find that line. The single line that we do have is Franklin Roosevelt pleading against, quote, the danger that politicians will accept as inevitable the destruction of innocent people to achieve their goals, and that scientists will con concentrate on the means and not the ends of their research. Was he talking about himself or what? Who was he, he, here he was, the guy who had accepted as inevitable the destruction of Coventry at all for the ends of getting, of, of, de of defeating the Nazis and the, and the Japanese. And he's the man who, who directed the best scientists on Earth to build the deadliest and stupidest damn bomb on the history of history. And he knew it. And so he was going to describe that this was in place. And by alerting the world that, that, that Los Alamos existed and the Manhattan Project was underway, he was also going to say, we have the technology. It's in hand. We can use it. But we're not going to. And when this world war is over, 
We're going to join with Russia, China, England. We're going to share the science and destroy it. And part of our goal of disarmament will be to guarantee that nobody ever gets it again. And along with that, no secret services. And he died the day before he gave that speech. On the 12th of April. If Franklin Roosevelt had lived one more day, you and I would not be sitting here. The whole of history from that day forward would be a completely different world. And democracy might actually exist. And it's extraordinary to me, as a historian, how little is made of that truth when historians look at World War II. The book that I have used most for this presentation comes, and the last one, Bill Stevenson's biography, A Man Called Intrepid, which details all of this stuff about, you know, the, you know, the Enigma machine, the secret wars, that speech, etc. If you Google it, there's nothing that follows. There's one book called M Ultra, which talks about the, something about Bletchley. There's a movie that we have called The Imitation Game, but that's it. And why is that? I ask myself. And it's because it's so convenient to our own sense of what came after Roosevelt's death. What came after was this, oh, now what? And we have this guy named Truman, has no idea there's even a Manhattan Project, never even thought about foreign policy, was in Europe once as a corporal during World War I, He's described by several historians as the least prepared man to enter the presidency in US history. And he's surrounded by all of these, all of these That's historic State now. Department, huh? Isn't that historic now? <laughs> well, you, you get to believe what you want to. Um, <laughs> he's surrounded by all these State Department uh, anti-Bolsheviks. And, you know, what's going to happen? Well, he dies, and word of that gets to Russia. Harriman gets on a plane and starts his way back to Washington to, to you know, to, like, woo, to, to, to talk to Truman. Takes four days to get back to Washington from, from uh, you know, Moscow in 1944 during World War II. And, <clears throat> you know, Harriman leaves Kennan as the ambassador to Russia. Get back there, and it's just a struggle in DC with Truman. What are we gonna do about the bomb? You know, officially, Russia has no idea about it. We know that they did. Roosevelt had known, but he didn't tell anybody. Bill Stevenson knew, Donovan knew, but they were secret agents. They're not gonna tell anybody. So Truman and the State Department are acting on the supposition that, in fact, the atomic bomb is not a known entity to Stalin and the Russians. And Truman is getting all giddy about this new secret ace in his hole. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous situation. Meanwhile, you know, the, the people who, from Wall Street, who are <laughs> advising Truman, almost all of them are Wall Street, Harvard, Yale Law, um, are seeing a new future. And one of my favorite quotes that I didn't have us read came from an essay that Henry Luce wrote in 1941 called The American Century. And, you know, I don't have time to get back to that, but, um, but Henry Luce was a Republican who had campaigned very heavily in favor of Truman's opposite, you know, Truman's opponent in the 40 election, which was Wendell Wilton. And Henry Luce was also skull and bones with, with FDR. And he wrote this, this essay in 1941, it's fun to read, called An American Century, for which the term was still coined, way before Pearl Harbor, in which he, he describes the world, uh, and he, he opens the essay by saying, we are in war already, 1941, February. But he describes what's gonna come, how we're gonna win the war, and then there's going to be this American century after it. And he's coming from a place, he owns time life, a Wall Street mentality. And he says, my favorite quote is, 
then it will be up to the United States to accept wholeheartedly our duty and our opportunity as the most powerful and vital nation in the world and in consequence to exert upon the world the full impact of our influence for such purposes as we see fit by such means as we see fit. Those are the people surrounding Truman as Harriman comes back. And there's a, you know, there's a big debate back and forth. Uh, are we going to show the Russians this nuclear science? Yes, no. Kennan says no. Henry Stimson, another skull and bones, Yale man, friend of Roosevelt's, still in the Secretary of War, 77 years old, says, yes, there's no secret here. It's published information. Nothing happens. And Roosevelt, I mean, Truman gets this, that finally then, right in this early period, Truman gets the report, the investigation, this is important, that Roosevelt had made on Donovan and the OSS that had been leaked back to, you know, to, to end the possibility of a, a post-war spy source. He gets that in, in uh, April, May of 1945. He reads it, and he's aghast that he doesn't want to be the one who starts an American Gestapo either. So he signs an executive order um, on September 20th, 1945, officially ending the possibility, true, of a post-war spy service. Five days later, Donovan, whose closest you know, allies are Alan Dulles, Bill Donovan, Alan Dulles, Richard Helms, and William Casey. Those are the top leaders of the OSS, names we all, most of us, know. They contact an OSS guy who's a general, Brigadier General Magruder, who's now been stationed in the Pentagon, to walk down the hallway to their good friend, John McCloy, who's Under Secretary of War, another Harvard Law, Wall Street lawyer, good friends, McCloy's of the loose mentality. We shall do what we want to the world. And Magruder, prepared by Donovan et al., persuades McCloy, we've got to have a secret service. We've just got to have a spy agency. And so the two of them create, on paper, they sign together a letter in creating the, the, the Secret Services Unit, SSU. And with that paper, they authorized Donovan to continue his actions and his operations in Europe. Oh, that's cute. Excuse me. That's me. And um, there's no funding. It's not legal. And it contravenes the President of the United States. But Donovan takes it, and, 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 and Richard Helms, and, and uh, Alan Dulles proceed to, and they, they, this is described, they're reading, news, they're reading telephone books in Berlin. They've rented a mansion in Berlin. They're reading telephone books to see if they can identify addresses of Germans that they see collaborating with the Russians. That's our spies at work. Months start to pass, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they really are interested in this idea of a secret spy network. Meanwhile, Kennan in Russia gets the idea that, you know, maybe Truman's gonna, gonna share this nuclear science with, with the Russians. And so he starts throwing his letters to, to uh, Truman, saying that's the stupidest idea you could possibly do. And Truman starts to waver. And so in, in uh, December, no, January 1946, Truman signs an agreement to create the Central Intelligence Group. But, again, he's not going to tell Congress, and he doesn't want anybody to know, because he's not the one who's going to start an American Gestapo. But he, what he does, because there's no money, is he goes to Senator Arthur Vandenberg, Republican from Michigan, head of the Chiefs, uh, Armed Services Committee, close ally of Henry Luce. And Vandenberg secrets 15 million into Truman's hands to start the Central Intelligence Group. 
he also goes to the, his Secretary of State, James Burns, extremely racist governor of North Carolina, now Secretary of State, who hates the Bolsheviks too. And Burns gives him another $10 million. So we've got $25 million to start this Central Intelligence Group. But Truman himself is now breaking the law, doing it against congressional, the Congress doesn't know, and he's giving them money without congressional knowledge. That's what's illegal. The Constitution says you can't do that. Truman knows that Roosevelt did that. Roosevelt did that because there were Nazis invading Poland, France, Netherlands, killing indiscriminately, and the Americans were, you know, had their head in the sea. So there's that moment, Franklin Roosevelt. Then there's 1946, and we got the United States absolutely in control of the situation, worrying about whether they're going to share nuclear science with the Russians. And Truman decides somehow or other that's an equal moment, that he is legitimated in being an illegal funder of secret army because times are tough. We, you, I get to decide whether that's the case, you know? But the Under Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, was sort of ambivalent himself at that very moment. And so he sent out a directive to experts in the field, Russian experts in the field, what's their thinking? And George Kennan had been waiting his life for this directive. And he wrote on George Washington's birthday in 1946, he wrote an 8,000-word memo that's called the Long Telegram. And Harriman was nowhere to be found. It went straight to the White House and to the State Department. And oh, was Kennan happy. And all the people in the State Department and other agencies, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we're so glad to have this document that says the Russians cannot be dealt with. They're not only, you can't, they can't deal with them, they're out for global control of everything. So we have another quote here. Quote eight. This comes from that long telegram, page two. Remember Kennan's first uh, quote. We have here in Moscow a political force committed fanatically to the belief that with the United States there can be no permanent modus vivendi, that it is desirable and necessary that the internal harmony of our society be disrupted, our traditional way of life, again, that same phrase, be destroyed, the international authority of our state be broken. The Soviet Union has an elaborate and far-flung apparatus for exertion of its influence in other countries, an apparatus of amazing flexibility and versatility, managed by people whose experience and skill in underground methods are presumably without parallel in history. Respond only, they respond, Soviets respond only to the logic of force. If the adversary has sufficient force and makes clear his readiness to use it, he rarely has to do so. The long telegram is the basis of what became the Truman Doctrine, the basis of what became the containment theory, the basis of what became, became the Cold War. And <clears throat> Gail has indicated that I have a, the time is, is closing in, so I'll try to close in here. Um, quickly, the, the moments after that, uh, are the creation of this sort of fury in Washington, D.C. about this Soviet menace, this threat. And, and, and these words that Kennan used, and remember how Roy Anderson had critiqued him. He's intellectually arrogant. He, he goes off the chart. He bats a clock. He's calling the Russians the most sophisticated, flexible. This is at the end of World War II. They can hardly breathe let alone send agents into Bolivia. And yet, somehow Washington just embraces this notion because what's it gonna mean? It's gonna mean a permanent war economy. These guys who are under Secretary of State, under Secretary of War, under Secretary of Treasury, who have 
MBAs from Harvard and seats on Wall Street and in the stock exchange. They see a future. Henry Liu sees a future. And they go with it. And, and it's all put in place. And we had to live it. Those of us who are sitting in this room, every one of us, judging by what I'm looking at. And how, you know, I have a slew of words here. How absurdly ugly and unjust and undemocratic has it been? And one of the great, or one of the leading architects of the actual policy formation is a guy named Clark Clifford, who all of us will also remember from Vietnam. Clifford was in the State Department from 1938 into the 70s. And, you know, he started to try to build his own legacy, protect himself at the end of his life. And in 1979, he gave, a, he gave an interview to um, Carl Bernstein. And uh, he tried to walk back everything that he had written back in the 1940s. And he said to Carl Bernstein, refer to 1946 and 47. I felt the whole thing was being manufactured. I had, I had the sensation that the president didn't attach fundamental importance to the so-called communist scare. We did not believe there was a real problem. A problem was being manufactured. There was a certain element of hysteria. May he rot in hell. But let's look at it. The CIA gets funded and founded in the National Security Act of September 1947, a few months after the Truman Doctrine has been uh, announced. If you turn to the last quote, here are quotes from the National Security Act relating to how the CIA is supposed to operate. Covert activities, as used in this title, and then it describes them, Next paragraph. Each covert operation has to be based on the president finding the action necessary to support identifiable foreign policy objectives of the United States and important to the national security of the United States. Each covert action. The bold. A finding may not authorize any action that would violate the Constitution or any statute of the United States. Skip the unquoted, go to the bold. Nothing in this act shall be construed as authority to withhold information from the Congressional Intelligence Committees on the grounds that providing the information to Congressional Intelligence Committees would constitute an un the unauthorized disclosure of classified information. The CIA, not for one day, acted on the law. Not for one day. It has broken the Constitution in every action it has ever taken. It has lied about everything it does. It does not inform congressional committees based on national security, which is against its own law, its own code of action. So what do we have? The first post-war spy agency contravened the presidential order five days after that order was signed. The second post-war spy agency was funded illegally by the president. And he knew it. The third post-war spy agency was created in such a manner as to be absolutely illegal from day one. That's what I call the bastard birth of the Cold War. Two minutes before one o'clock. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. What do you think? Yeah, very well. Yeah. Very optimistic and inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You know, if we could only uh, quote the, the law of the National Security Act, if we could get that in the streets 
Every time anything comes up about our action, this is what the CIA is, but how many times does it break the Constitution? If we can get our representatives in Congress, if, if, if um, to abide by their representative responsibility. These things, are, it's totally, abjectly, brazenly illegal. We know it. Well, let's do something about it, right? All us lawyers here with Wall Street connections. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. You know, we're, we're in the post-constitutional age and the post-truth age. It doesn't leave us a lot of options. Although the river's really nice. And the day is sunny. So let's go have lunch. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd just like to make uh, an announcement about our next uh, Strasbourg Democracy Forum. Tim Kipp will be presenting on the, this time it's not on the second Wednesday, it's on the third Wednesday because the Brattleboro Fire Department wanted to present on the opioid crisis on the Wednesday that we had planned. Um, so his presentation is very fitting following uh, Nick's. Nobody is above the law, really. So, come on the 18th. Thanks so much. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So you don't have to. You don't have to leave. You're welcome to uh, talk to Nick as long as he's willing to be here. I can do it. Doesn't hurt. Copy of this. I don't sleep on it, but I can sleep it out.